welcome to Tiger Rising chapters 9 and 10. We'll meet a new character uh, named Willie Mae in this, char in this uh, chapter and uh, try to make a picture of her from the way that she's described. It's pretty cool. Chapter 9. His father woke him up at 5.30 the next morning. Come on, son, he said, shaking Rob's shoulder. Come on, you're a working man now. You got to get up. He took his hand away and stood over Rob for a minute more, and then he left. Rob heard the door open to the motel room, and it squeaked. He opened his eyes. The world was dark. The only light came from the falling Kentucky star. Rob turned over in bed and pulled back the curtain, and he looked out the window at the sign. It was like having his own personal shooting star, but he didn't ever make a wish on it. He was afraid that if he started wishing, he might not be able to stop. In his suitcase of not thoughts, there were also not wishes. He kept the lid closed on them too. Rob leaned on his elbow and stared at the star and listened to the rain gently drumming its fingers on the roof. There was a warm, glowing kind of feeling in his stomach, a feeling he wasn't used to. It took him a minute to name it. The tiger. The tiger was out there. He got out of bed and put on shorts and a t-shirt. Still hot, his father said when Rob stepped out the door, and still raining. Mm-hmm, Rob said, rubbing his eyes. Yes, sir. If it don't stop soon, the whole state ain't going to be nothing but one big swamp. Rain don't bother me, Rob muttered. On the day of his mother's funeral, it had been so sunshiny it hurt his eyes. And after the funeral, he and his father had had to stand outside in the hot, bright light and shake everybody's hand. Some of the ladies hugged Rob, pulling them to them in jerky, desperate movements, smashing his head into their pillowy chests. If you don't look just like her, they had told him, rocking him back and forth and holding on to him tight. Or they said, you got your mama's hair, that cobwebby blonde. And then they ran their fingers through his hair and patted his head like he was a dog. And every time Rob's father's hand extended to someone else, Rob saw the ripped place in his suit where it had split open when he slapped Rob to make him stop crying. And it reminded Rob again, do not cry. Do not cry. That was what the son made him think of, the funeral. So he didn't care if he ever saw the sun again. He didn't care if the whole state did turn into a swamp. His father stood up and went back into the motel room and got himself a cup of coffee and brought it back outside. The steam rose off of it and curled into the air. Now that I'm a working man... Rob said shyly, could I drink some coffee? His father smiled at him. Well, he said, I guess that'd be all right. Rob went inside and poured himself a mug of coffee and brought it back outside. And he sat down next to his father and sipped it slowly. It tasted hot and dark and bitter. He liked it. All right, his father said after about 10 minutes, it's time to get to work. He stood up. It wasn't even six o'clock. As they walked out together alongside the back of the motel to the maintenance shed, his father started to whistle, mining for gold. It was a sad song he used to sing with Rob's mother. Her high, sweet voice had gone swooping over his father's deep one like a small bird flying over the solid world. His father must have remembered, too, because he stopped halfway through the song, shook his head, and cursed softly under his breath. Rob let his father walk ahead of him. He slowed down and stared into the woods, wanting to see some small part of the tiger, a flick of the tail or a glow for his eyes. But there was nothing to see except for rain and darkness. Come on, son, his father said, his voice hard, and Rob hurried to catch up. Chapter 10. Rob was sweeping the laundry room when Willie May, the Kentucky Star's housekeeper, came in and threw herself down in one of the metal chairs that were lined up against the cement block wall. You know what, she said to Rob. No, ma'am, said Rob. I'll tell you what, said Willie May. She reached up and adjusted the butterfly clip in her thick black hair. I'd rather be sweeping up after some pigs in a barn than cleaning up after people in this place. Pigs at least give you some respect. Rob leaned on his broom and stared at Willie May. He liked looking at her. Her face was smooth and dark like a beautiful piece of wood and Rob liked to think that if he had been the one who carved Willie May, he would have made her just the way she was, with her long nose and high cheekbones and her slanted eyes. What you staring at, Willie May asked, her eyes narrowed. And what are you doing out of school? I don't know, Rob shrugged. What do you mean you don't know? 
Rob shrugged again. Don't be moving your shoulders up and down in front of me, acting like some skinny old bird trying to fly away. You want to end up cleaning motel rooms for a living? Rob shook his head. That's right. Ain't nobody wants this job. I'm the only fool Beauchamp can pay to do it. You got to stay in school, she said, else you'll end up like me. She shook her head and reached into the pocket of her dress. She pulled out a single cigarette and two sticks of eight ball licorice gum. She put one piece of gum in her mouth, handed the other one to Rob, lit her cigarette, leaned back in the chair and closed her eyes. Now, she said, the scent of smoke and licorice slowly filled the laundry room. Go on. Tell me why you ain't in school. On account of my legs being all broke out, Rob said. Willie May opened her eyes and looked over the top of her glasses at Rob's legs. Hmm, she said after a long minute. How long you had that? About six months, said Rob. I'll tell you how to cure that, said Willie May, pointing with a cigarette at his legs. I'll tell you right now, don't need to go to no doctor. Huh, said Rob. He stopped chewing his gum and held his breath. <gasps> what if Willie May healed him and then he had to go back to school? Sadness, said Willie May, closing her eyes and nodding her head. You keeping all that sadness down low in your legs. You're not letting it get up to your heart where it belongs. You gotta let that sadness rise on up. Oh, said Rob, and he let his breath out. He was relieved. Willie May was wrong. She couldn't cure him. The principal thinks it's contagious, he said. Man ain't got no sense, Willie May said. Well, he's got a lot of certificates, Rob offered. They're all framed and hung up in his wall. I bet he ain't got no certificate for sense, though, said Willie May. She rose up out of her chair and stretched. I gotta clean some rooms, she said. You ain't gonna forget what I told you about them legs, are you? No, ma'am, said Rob. What'd I tell you then, she said, towering over him. Willie May was tall, the tallest person Rob had ever seen. To let the sadness rise, Rob said. He repeated the words as if they were part of a poem. He gave them a certain rhythm, the same way Willie May had when she'd said them. That's right, said Willie May. You got to let the sadness rise on up. She left the room in a swirl of licorice and smoke. After she was gone, Rob wished that he had told her about the tiger. He felt a sudden desperate need to tell somebody, somebody who wouldn't doubt him, somebody who was capable of believing in tigers.